As we go into this G20, I, I've read many stories, but the bottom line, I think, for, for Merkel, she described the, the six to one divisions at the last meeting. This G20 gets off with Poland doing deal, with, with Trump doing deals in Poland. It's an inauspicious backdrop to G20, isn't it? I'm not sure it is. Um, anytime we go into these multilateral summits, I think the really Im uh, important thing to recognize is that the work of the G20 in that big room is important and then the work in the bilaterals around it generally tend to focus on the urgent and leaders have to deal both with urgent issues like North Korea but they have to deal with important issues like global growth I don't think there would be much difference in the room that the key to global growth is free and fair trade flexible exchange rates set in open competitive markets and the free flow of capital across borders based on open investment policies. I think if we take that as the foundation of the successful global economy, we might have differences on how to approach that, but I think there's a common interest in trying to jumpstart the global economy to move it to higher levels of growth, both in the U.S. and abroad. Can I ask you, do you think that President Trump's ambition is a global ambition? Uh, he's told us it is America first, and America very firmly first. That, sir, is very different to global ambitions. The EU, we understand, ready to do a deal with Japan. Merkel, the ambassador, along with, with, with Abe and Xi, the voices of free trade, some PR there, I know. Is Trump really a globalist ambition in terms of trade? He has said America first, but he says it doesn't mean America only. Um, whether it be TPP, the Paris Agreement, he has problems with how they were negotiated prior to his entry into office, but he said he's ready to re-engage on those. And interestingly, in his first meeting with Angela Merkel in Washington, she came away believing that he was quite open to continuing the negotiations on TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. So, yes, he's going to go into these with a tough position. I think he has made it clear he'll put America first. But, of course, doesn't every world leader have a first responsibility to their own country? And then by engaging globally, they do well for their country and the world more broadly. I think part of the problem, though, is that from, from the European perspective is, is that... And, by the way, it, uh, we saw Mr Trump's defence of the West yesterday, a very, very strong defence. Some would say that his language, his tone and intonation um, was quite religious. The invective that he used wasn't necessarily the spirit of the kind of language that you expect from, from a world leader in regards to democracy, etc. It was a slightly more religious inflection. Um, he hasn't exactly endeared himself to the leaders of the other 19, has he, thus far? I think it is um, on a case-by-case -case basis. Some of these leaders he's met in Washington, I think each of the leaders he's met, he's tried to lay a foundation for that bilateral relationship. Others he'll be meeting for the first time, like Putin, obviously. Uh, this will be his first time in that much larger setting. Um, and I would say that the fact that he's there, the fact that he is engaging, says that he recognizes that America to be prosperous at home must be strong and engaged abroad. And to be strong and engaged abroad, we also have to have a healthy economy at home. This is uh, Robert Kimmett, the former U.S. ambassador to Germany, sitting alongside me here in the studio. You're looking at live shots of Hamburg, where you have a military presence. North Korea is probably the most significant geopolitic issue at the moment. Do you feel, as a former U.S. ambassador into Germany, how important is it that Trump and Xi Jinping have a constructive meeting today. Does the United States need China to bring more pressure to bear on North Korea? The meeting is vital, and China needs to play an especially important role with regard to North Korea, given their both political and commercial relationship. China, along with Russia, the United States, Japan, and others have, were part of the talks, the six-party talks, that have fallen apart. Now, because North Korea does not want to engage, I think the effort is going to be to try to go through the UN. There was blockage last night by the Russians and the Chinese of a UN statement. I think that has to be front and center in the discussions both with Xi, but also with Putin. How close are we to uh, a warlike situation with North Korea? I'll let someone else make that judgment, but if you look at what the US military commander on the ground said, what the US officials have said, they have basically made clear 
that the direction that North Korea is heading, both on its nuclear and on its missile program, is unacceptable, that they prefer a diplomatic solution, economic measures if necessary to help produce that solution, but they are not taking the military option off the table. Trump meets Putin. We have 60 seconds. Who has the upper hand in that meeting? Our, our, our writers say that the ex-spy master could get the upper hand of Trump. Your perspective? I think you have two very strong personalities going into that meeting. Um, Putin has his background. Trump has his own background. What I would say, though, is there are bilateral issues. But right now, we have U.S. and Russian airplanes flying over Syria. We need to deconflict those operations. We have interests in Iran. We have interests in North Korea. I think there's a wide array of issues for the two of them to discuss, but they've got to get the bilateral relationship right first.